Thank you, Seth. That's a, a great scripture reading you just gave us. I want to thank all of you for letting me have a couple of weeks off. It was a restful time. I didn't go anywhere. I stuck around here and did some reading and some relaxing and watching the live feed. Uh, very appreciative of Mark's ministry. In fact, we learned this morning from, Psalm, from Proverbs 25, verse 13, that a faithful messenger refreshes the soul. And Mark certainly did that for us. And we have a great message from the book of John this morning, and it's very good to be back into that great book and this great passage of John chapter 10. But this passage that should refresh our soul this morning is John chapter 10, verses 16 through 21. So please follow along with me as I read it. You remember in chapter 9, Jesus healed the blind man. At the end of that passage, the blind man understands who healed him, understands who he is, and believes in him. But a discussion has ensued from then, and it continues into chapter 10, in which the Lord is speaking to these, and there's a division uh, among these Jewish men as to who Christ is. Well, with a Discussion is continuing in verse 16, and Jesus says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, He has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Well, may the Lord bless our study of this word and open our eyes to what John has recorded and Jesus has said and build us up in the faith. Let's ask the Lord for his blessing. On the uh, the morning of May 4th, 1873, missionary David Livingston was found by his African friends dead on his knees. He had died in prayer. They buried his heart in Africa and they carried his body to the coast. It was shipped to England and buried in Westminster Abbey. Inscribed on his tomb is John chapter 10, verse 16. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. That inscription inspired Peter Cameron Scott to return to Africa. He founded the Africa Inland Mission to carry on the work that Livingston devoted his life to. That verse and its passage in John 10 is a missionary text for home missions as well as foreign missions. It is an incentive to evangelism, which might be surprising to some because this passage is about election. But the reality is, divine election, unconditional election, is not an obstacle to the gospel. It is an encouragement to that great ministry. In fact, it's what makes evangelism possible. Jesus has been talking about sheep and shepherds and sheepfolds all through chapter 10. He began by telling a parable about a shepherd who comes to a fold and he calls out his sheep. The shepherd is the Lord and the fold is Judaism. He doesn't call out all of the sheep. He calls out only those who are his sheep. He calls them by name and they follow him because they know him. It illustrates what the Lord was doing throughout his ministry. He would called the blind man in chapter 9 whom he healed to himself. Earlier, he called the disciples to himself, and he called others. 
He called them out of Judaism to follow him. But now we read in verse 16 of other sheep and other folds. I have other sheep, he said, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. The other sheep are Gentiles. They never belonged to the fold of Judaism, and, and they could not have been accommodated within that fold. They are the ones who are described later in chapter 11 as the children of God who are scattered abroad, scattered across the world and, and down through every generation of time. They are found in the fold of paganism in the fold of intellectualism, in the fold of science, in business, in politics, people in all walks of life, in all different institutions, in every nation and ethnic group and class. Everywhere in the world, Christ has His sheep, His people, those who have been given to Him by the Father, according to chapter 6 and verse 37 and for whom he came to lay down his life as the good shepherd. He has said that twice in the previous verses, in verses 11 and verse 15, and he says it again later in verse 17. It is the reason he came into the world, to die for his sheep who are his elect. Now they're not explicitly identified in that way, it, the word elect or the word chosen is not used here, but it is certainly the meaning of the Lord's words. Notice exactly what the Lord said and what He did not say. He didn't say, I shall have other sheep, or I hope to have other sheep. He said, I have other sheep. They were already His. Even though He had not yet gathered them, even though they were in, in, in a different fold, still in darkness, scattered abroad in Samaria, in Asia, in Africa, in Europe and beyond. Nevertheless, they belonged to Him because the Father had given them to Him in eternity past. I have other sheep, He said. It's a statement like one that Paul was made to the Apostle Paul, recorded in Acts chapter 8. Paul was in Corinth, and he had met a great deal of resistance there and opposition in the synagogue and in the city, and men were opposing the gospel, and Paul was evidently somewhat discouraged because one night the Lord appeared to him in a vision, and he said, Do not be afraid any longer. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. His people were already there. They didn't know they were his people. May not have known who Christ was. Some were Jews in the synagogue. Some were pagans worshiping in the temple of Apollo. But they belonged to Christ. And Paul would be the Lord's agent to call them out of darkness into the light. That was a great comfort to the Apostle Paul, and it should be to all of us. He was saying to Paul, Paul, there's resistance, but don't worry. I have people in this city. I have multitudes in this city. Go get them. It's all been prepared. Election troubles people. It shouldn't. They think it's unfair and that it's an obstacle to evangelism, that it, uh, it seems to make a mockery of evangelism. Why evangelize if Christ already has sheep, already has His chosen ones? Well, we can answer that question with another question. Why evangelize if it were otherwise? If there were no elect ones, why give the gospel? Election is, in fact, the reason that we do give the gospel. Consider Romans chapter 3, verse 11 and verse 12. There is none who understands... 
There is none who seeks for God. None who does good. There is not even one. Now that's from Psalm 14. That's David. That's the saint of the Old Testament. And Paul is quoting that in Romans chapter 3, a saint of the New Testament. It's the doctrine of the inability of man in both the Old and the New Testament. That's the testimony of all of Scripture. Now, if God has not already chosen some, will anyone seek for Him? Will any do good and believe the message of salvation in Christ? No. Paul says that none, absolutely none, seek Him or choose Him. None, that is, apart from divine grace. But grace makes the difference. Election ensures that some will come and that his, that, and all that, that will come are His chosen ones. And they're not a few. I say some, not some in the sense of a little amount. A great many will come. That's the way it's described for us in, the, in other passages in the Word of God. We're told that uh, to Abraham was told and the other patriarchs were told that the number of those who would be their seed would be their descendants, would be as like the sand of the seashore and uh, the stars of the heaven and the dust of the earth. Have you ever tried to count the dust of the earth? It's innumerable. And that's the, the, the elect that God has chosen. And an immense number of people. They are Christ's sheep. God the Father gave them to His Son, who redeemed them, bought them with His own precious blood. And so in spite of the opposition, Paul could go on speaking, giving the gospel, because the sheep are there and will hear the Lord's voice and will come. Election doesn't hinder evangelism. What, what happened in 1849 when people heard there was gold in the hills of California? The California gold rush. And put an emphasis on that word rush. They rushed for the gold because it was there. It was in those hills. And election is incentive to preach. It was incentive to the Apostle Paul. The souls are there. Go get them. As for being unfair... Well, the opposite is true. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We are all guilty by nature. The only thing God owes us is judgment. No one deserves salvation. But God has had mercy on mankind, and He has chosen to save some. He's chosen to save many. He's chosen to save a vast multitude. And that's reflected in the Lord's statement here. I have other sheep, and I must bring them also. Put an emphasis on that word must. I must. It is necessary that He bring them. That means He will. He cannot fail to do what He must do. You and I can fail, but the Son of God can't. And He must bring those for whom He came. Then he states how he will do it. He says, they will hear my voice. Well, how will they hear his voice? Through the giving of the gospel. They will hear it. They will appreciate it. They will respond to it. Now, <clears throat> that in itself is miraculous. That in itself is supernatural. There is no other way to explain it because as Paul says and tells us, the, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They hear it, they think it's foolish. Naturally. And yet, in verses 27 and 28, the Lord said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. And multitudes have done that and will continue to do that. Not because of our persuasiveness, because we have persuasive words or we have effective methods, but because of Christ's persuasive and effective voice. He calls people through the giving of the Gospel. 
And by the influence of the Holy Spirit who is in that message, who is in His Word, they hear and they believe. But He does it through the simple message of the Gospel of God's grace, which is received through faith and faith alone. That is His means of bringing people to salvation. And we can expect that they will come. We can expect success in the giving of the gospel because Christ said, I must bring them. And He will in His time and His way. And people may resist it. And we may become discouraged. Maybe it's a family member. We get discouraged because they're not responding. Well, Paul didn't respond. When he was Saul of Tarsus and Stephen gave his brilliant speech before the Jews in the synagogue, what was the result of this brilliant man that none of them could, could thwart in the debates and discussions they had? Stephen was powerful in the things that he said. They stoned him. And they laid their garments at the feet of Saul of Tarsus, this young rabbi. He wasn't convicted either. Now, I don't doubt that seeds were sown in the heart of, of, that, uh, of, that, of him at that time, but it wasn't until later when Jesus directly spoke to him that he came. Christ brought him at the right time in his way, and we can have that confidence as well with those we speak to. And I think that's incentive. should be incentive to give the gospel and be active in serving the Lord, to be, be active in missions, whether it's the mission field in a foreign land or the mission field in our own backyard. It was incentive for David Livingston. A lot has been written about him, and, and not all of it has been flattering for all of his efforts. He had reportedly only one convert who soon lapsed making it zero. But God doesn't promise us converts. Some plant spiritual seed, and others water that seed. But as Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, God causes the growth. He's sovereign. He produces the results, not we. We're to be faithful. Livingston was. It was said probably no missionary in Africa had ever preached to so many Africans as David Livingston. He never gave up on Africa. Never became disillusioned with the Lord. His, his last act on earth was to pray. And no doubt pray for the salvation of Africa. Why? Why didn't he give up and go back to Scotland? Because he knew God has other sheep. And they were there on that vast continent. Election is incentive to labor faithfully, to labor patiently. And his service inspired others to carry on the ministry. The seed that was sown was watered by others. And through it all, God gave the growth. Now the church in Africa is stronger than the church in Europe. It's the Lord's work. He leads His sheep out of all kinds of sheepfolds into a new flock. They will become one flock, the Lord said. Jews and Gentiles together. That's the church universal. Church is a body of believers made up of all kinds of people. Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor. In the church, divisions are ended. Hostilities are healed. Enemies become friends. We read through the, the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, we see this great division among mankind. It's because it's between Israel and the nations. Jews hated Gentiles. They considered them unclean, and they were. They considered them pariahs like wild dogs. They wouldn't enter their homes. They wouldn't share a meal with them. And Gentiles despised Jews. They considered them odd. They considered them antisocial and unsophisticated. And the ancient world was filled with anti-Semitism. And yet, 
in Christ, through the gospel, the two have become unified. They become one flock in one church. That's the grace of God. It's the same grace and the same blood that's the healing of the nations. At the time the Lord spoke, His audience likely didn't understand Him. They couldn't imagine that God had sheep in Greece or in Rome or among the barbarians in Britain. But they should have. They should have known that. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, the initial promise given to Abraham is, God, is what, that God told him, in him, that is in Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's what the initial great promise that the people of Israel had. In Abraham and through his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. In Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6, the prophecy is given that the Messiah will be a light to the nations and His salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. God's plan of salvation has always been worldwide in its scope. Israel had, had largely failed to understand that and could only think of other sheep as other Jews scattered abroad, but the Lord's plan is far greater far glorious than that. It unifies disparate groups into one. And they have common communion together as spiritual equals in, in this, this one great flock. They have a common destiny upon the earth, the, the kingdom to come. They, they have a, a common mission. The great division that occurred at the Tower of Babel when God divided the earth by languages, the, the division that was seen even earlier when Cain killed his brother Abel, that division is joined, it's reconciled in the church. And the world should see that. It's, it is the, the fulfillment of Christ's plan and work. When we don't show that, when, when there are divisions in the church, and there often are, well, then the witness of the gospel is hindered. The grace of God is not seen as it ought to be seen. When that happens, I, I think, and I don't want to be absolute and general in that, in saying this, because I think sometimes divisions are necessary. They happen with two groups or two people that have a different view of things that are incompatible, and there must be a separation. But very often, it's a failure these divisions are a failure due to the, to, to the failure to draw close to the one who binds us together, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one shepherd of the flock. That's how he describes himself next. They will become one flock with one shepherd. He's the source of our unity. Apart from him, there is no real unity. Later in chapter 15, he calls himself the vine. And we are the branches in him. We draw our life from him. We are united to one another through him. And through our connection to him. Here, we are his flock. And we have our unity around him as our shepherd. Our unity in him is based on our common confession that Jesus is the Christ that He is the eternal Son of God. It is in the belief in His deity as the second person of the Trinity, as well as in His humanity. Both are equally important and necessary. Now those who deny one or the other, those who deny that He is the eternal Son of God, that, that, that simply see Him as a man and a great teacher, they are not sheep. And He is not their shepherd. They are not branches in the vine. There is no unity with them. The, the true shepherd, the good shepherd, is God's eternal Son. He knows us. We know Him. And as our shepherd, He guides us to blessing and protects us from danger. And danger may be suggested in all that Jesus is describing here. The flock is not a fold. What the Lord is describing here is not sheep gathered within the four walls of a sheepfold, but, 
but a, a great flock that is out in the open pasture where they are vulnerable to danger, to wild beasts. But we are secure because our Savior is with us, there to protect us. Security is not in four walls of the Mosaic law. Often that's where people seek protection within the, the law or within rules and taboos that we add to the Word of God. We don't need to add anything to Scripture and what Scripture teaches. It reveals that uh, it, it is sufficient in itself and it reveals that our safety is the person and power of Christ, our Good Shepherd. And we experience that according to our proximity to Him. In other words, as we grow close to Him, we grow close to one another. We, we gain His mind. We gain His character. This is part of sanctification. As we know Him and fellowship with Him, we become more and more like Him. We become more selfless. And the church is safer. And the church is more unified. Marriages are more complete if there's difficulty in marriage, one must ask himself, have I grown apart from the Lord? We need to grow close to Him. It brings us together. Our future is certain and glorious, and our present is secure and productive, all because of Christ and what He has done for us and is presently doing for us, and we need to grow close to Him as our shepherd. But it, it's what He has done for us that is emphasized in this passage. He is the Good Shepherd, and His goodness is revealed in His sacrifice for the sheep. Twice He has said that He lays down His life for them. Verses 11 and 15. And now in verse 17, He again repeats this, this theme of sacrifice by saying, I lay down my life. He would do it willingly, which set him apart from, from all shepherds. Good ones would lay their lives on the line for their sheep, but they would never willingly, uh, purposely die for the sheep. They tried to avoid that. If they died for the sheep, well, the sheep would be lost. But Christ did that. He purposefully laid down His life for the sheep. And we considered that the, the last lesson we had in the Gospel of John. His, his death was suffered with a view... Um, his death was the way in which He would bring His sheep to Himself. And we studied how it is an effective purchase... Not simply something provided, but it is effective. It actually removed the penalty of sin that was against us because He bore it in our place. It was there at the cross that He actually saved His people. And, and the, the atonement that He made is applied by the Spirit of God to the people of God down through the ages in God's time and His way. And so it's called a purchase. That's often how the death of Christ is referred to. He purchased us. He bought us. And, that's, and, and did so at the cost of His life. At the cost of His own blood. And so we've studied that, and that's been made a point. And it needs to be a point that's emphasized. If we want to understand the cross, we must understand it as an effective purchase. And he has spoken of it in that way. But now we learn something more. His death was suffered with a view toward regaining his life. It, it was suffered with a, an understanding and with a view toward the resurrection. I lay down my life, he said, so that I may take it again. And that is unusual. That is actually unique. No ordinary shepherd could do that. He could lay down his life he could voluntarily put himself in harm's way and die. A shepherd could do that. That's unusual, but he could do it, yet he would never recover from it. 
But the Lord did. He laid down his life to take it again. He died in order that he might rise again and give eternal life to his sheep and give them glorified life in the resurrection to come. But he could not have done that had he not given his life, had he not laid it down for the sheep and done that in obedience to his Father's will. And the Father loved him for it. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Now, that didn't mean that the Father's love for his Son was uh, a conditional love, that uh, he would only love him if he agreed to do what he has commissioned him to do. Uh, if he withheld that, he would not love him. It's not the idea that's presented here. The Father loved the Son from all eternity because he is the Son who was always in agreement with the Father's plan of salvation and suffered death in order to rise and raise up his sheep in the last day. Raise them to glory. So the death of Christ as our good shepherd was voluntary and purposeful. It was not a mistake. It was not an accident of history. He was no martyr. He was a savior. As he said in verse 18, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Christ was in complete command of his life from beginning to end. That was demonstrated all through his life and ministry. Men tried to lay their hands on him, but they couldn't. His hour had not yet come. Later, when the arresting soldiers came for him in the Garden of Gethsemane, they fell to the ground when, when Christ simply said the words, I am He. He could have easily walked over them and left the garden unharmed. Or as, as He told Peter, He could have asked His Father and He would send to Him twelve legions of angels to rescue Him. He didn't do that. He didn't deliberately. He gave himself into the hands of the enemy in order to carry out the Father's will to die for all the Father had chosen and given to his Son to redeem. That's the love of God. That's the love of the Father for us. It's the love of the Son for the Father and the love of the Son for us. Normally when people die, their spirit goes out and their head falls. But... On the cross, we read that the Lord first bowed his head and then dismissed his spirit. He commanded his life to go out of him. No one took his life from him. The Lord was in control to the last moment. He rules over death itself. Ruled over his death, rules over your death. And that should be something that gives us comfort as we consider life and all of the vicissitudes of life and the difficulties of life and the challenges of life from the greatest challenge, which is the grave, which is death, to the least. He has authority over death. He has authority over everything. Every difficulty, every danger that we face. And that's encouraging. And that power is governed by His love for His sheep. He exercises His power in regard to us out of His love and according to His love for us. And He proved that by His death. How can we know that He loves us? By the cross. He laid down His life for the sheep. And that, someone said, is the anchor of our confidence when storms assail the vessel of the church. Even in those difficult times, even in those challenging times, we know that He loved us. And He loves us. Since He loved us enough to die for us, what will He not do for us now? Now that we're His children. 
Now that's, that's Paul's question in Romans 8, verse 32, where he asked, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If God has done the greatest for us, he'll certainly do the less for us. If he's given us the best, what won't he give us? He'll bestow every blessing upon us that we need. Especially now that we're his children, his friends, his people. What won't he do for us? Well, there's nothing that he will not do for us that is for our good. God's love is active. God's love is effective. He accomplishes his good purpose for his people. At the cross, he saved his people spread abroad over the face of the globe. But He not only died for us, He also was raised for us. He is alive and glorified, and He is seated at the Father's right hand in great power as our King and Priest. There He lives, He ever lives to make intercession for us, as the author of Hebrews wrote to give help to us in time of need, to, to deliver us from temptation, and to save us forever to the uttermost. His love never fails, and He will accomplish His purpose for us, which puts the destiny of the sheep beyond all hazard. When things look bleak, realize they are not. We can't see the end but we can know the one who is in control of the end and rest in Him. We have a living Savior who is in control of all things. In fact, in the first three verses of the book of Hebrews, He's described as bearing all things along, bearing the ages along, bringing history to its glorious conclusion. He's in control. That's good news. That's, that's the best news. The Lord spoke of salvation and hope. We have a good shepherd who laid down his life for us. Great words. But difficult words for some who were standing there hearing the Lord speak and say these things. And, and here we, we see clearly why divine election, unconditional election is necessary. When John wrote, a division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. People took sides. Many of them said uh, of Jesus, he has a demon, and he's out of his mind. He's insane. Why do you listen to this man? Well, Paul was called mad. In Acts chapter 26, he's delivering his uh, account of, of, of his conversion to King Agrippa. There's a great host of people there in Caesarea. Paul is in chains, and he comes into this you read the text, it's this august company of important people. With King Agrippa and Festus the governor, and he begins to give his, his, his testimony. How he was brought to saving knowledge of Christ. And, and finally, Festus interrupts him and calls him mad. You are mad, Paul. Your great learning has, has disturbed your mind. It's not unusual for the world to call someone who speaks of the sovereign grace of God mad, insane. Well, this is the way the natural man responds to God's glorious revelation and, and great works of grace, supernatural works of mercy. They are impossible for them to accept and believe. It's foolish to them. It's madness to them. Well, others in this group were not so quick to dismiss the Lord as demonic. These are not the sayings of one demon possessed, they said. But even that fell a bit short of an endorsement of Christ. Look, he, he gave sight to a man born blind. And, and people still could not believe in him. In in. in in spite of that great miracle that had taken place, which shows how necessary it is for the Lord to do the miracle of giving spiritual sight to people. Otherwise, they will not believe. The natural man left to himself with his own unaided faculties of intellect and perception 
and will is so incapable of understanding spiritual truth and responding properly to it, can't, so in, in, incapable that, as we have an example here, he can't distinguish between the words of God and the words of the devil. That's how confused the natural mind is. He hears promises of hope. He hears promises of forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life the most hopeful promises that can be given, and he rejects it all as insanity. Now that is absolutely hopeless. That's a condition that is absolutely hopeless, and men cannot change their condition any more than a leopard can change its spots. We need grace. We need sovereign grace. That's why God intervened and chose some elected men and women from the fallen mass of humanity to understand, elected them to believe in, in Christ and be saved. And, and not a few, again, not a few, but a multitude. Read Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, and you have this picture in heaven of the multitudes that have come out of the nations. Multitudes. Saved by the blood of Christ. Well, if that includes you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have new life, if you have eternal life, don't be disturbed by the doctrine of election. Understand it. Be grateful. It's grace. It's undeserved favor. If you've not believed... If in fact these things that I've said or that the Lord has said here seem foolish to you, then that's proof you are lost. Realize that. Realize your lost condition and believe in Christ who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. But you say, I may not be one of the elect. Well, you don't know that. The only way to know is to believe. That's the great evidence of election and grace. The elect believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do, you will discover that you were one of those other sheep Jesus spoke of. He had you on His mind ages ago when He laid down His life to save the sheep. May God help you to turn to Him and come to Him. May God help all of us to rest in His great love for us, His sovereign grace, and trust Him and live boldly for Him. Well, before we pray, let's stand and sing a hymn out of the white book, the hymns of praise, and read. We'll sing hymn number 28, His Robes for Mine, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 28. Father, we do give you the praise for our salvation. It's certainly not because of anything within us. I think the Scriptures make it very plain. We are slaves to sin and willingly slaves to sin. But you intervene by your grace. You chose an innumerable multitude to be your people. You sent your Son to redeem them, to save them. And Father, we have salvation through Him. Salvation is of the Lord, and so we do give You the praise. All the praise goes to our triune God. We thank You for Your grace. And now, it's true as we sang, our lives are not our own. We belong to You. So may we live lives of obedient service to You in gratitude for all that You've done for us. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord Lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.